We've been in a series, uh, Spring Endurance Training. We've been talking about that whole thing of entering into this training and what does it mean to be an endurance athlete for Jesus. We know what endurance athletes look like in this world. We see the Olympics and they come around and we see marathon runners and, and we get very impressed at these people that can endure physically. But what does it look like to be an endurance athlete for Jesus. Today we're going to be talking about discipline, but let's just really quick, Hebrews chapter 12 is where we've been focusing. Let's, let's just read sort of these verses that we've been reading, just a little bit of review. First of all, Hebrews 12, 1. Now this verse, and, and if, you, if you look in your bulletin, this is, your, this is our little let's live it challenge card, okay? And this is something that if you have them, why don't you grab these? Because let's just review this for a second again. What, what we do is every month we put this challenge card out, encouraging people to look at this um, every day, every week. And you can see the beginning part of this, we're praying for a persecuted nation. Uh, this week we're praying for the country of Oman. And, and so every day this week we want to be lifting up our brothers and sisters in that country. And so every month you'll see we get a different card with uh, different countries for every week. Then we have our challenge verse, and our challenge verse for this month is actually this verse, Hebrews 12, 1, that we're going to say together, all together in just a moment. And then on the bottom is one simple action, and that is just a simple way that we can be thinking about living out or applying what we've been talking about, being doers of the word and not hearers only. So why don't we, since this is the verse that, that we're being challenged this month to sort of let dwell inside of us. Let's say this verse together as we get started, okay? Hebrews 12.1, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. All right, excellent reading. Now, the goal is, is that you can kind of continue to repeat that. You can put this in your car. You can put this on your fridge. You can put this wherever you would see it regularly to just kind of continue to say that verse over and over and, and begin to think of what that looks like to run this race with endurance. And so then God's word then actually dwells inside of us. And that's when we start to see his word begin to change us. It has to dwell in us to then start to change us on the outside. And God does his work many times through his word like that. So that's what we talked about the first two weeks. Of course, that great cloud of witnesses. And then, then we literally, here at the foot of our cross, we, we laid the burdens of life displayed through these little cards. And we laid some of the sins that, that cling to us so closely. So that was the first two weeks. Then last week, we focused on focus. So our focus was focus, and we read Hebrews 12, verses 2 to 4. So let's, let's read these two verses. We don't have to read these together. But this says, looking to Jesus. Again, last week was all about where we focus. The founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Now that verse 2 really tells us that we are to develop a future focus. Remember we talked about that, how we are to develop a future focus for present joy. The only way I can experience joy in the present, true joy, is by developing a focus on the future. I fix my eyes on heaven. Okay, verse 3. Consider him, that's Jesus, who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. And then if you remember, we said we need to have a focused mind to endure current day Persecution, And so if we are being persecuted in any way, we talked about sometimes we don't go out and search for persecution. Sometimes it comes and finds us. And to endure that, whatever that looks like, we need to have a focused mind. And then verse 4, in your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And we talked about that verse brings us back to the Garden of Gethsemane. When Jesus was under such mental anguish, struggling against sin, struggling, being sinless. He didn't sin, but he was struggling with it to a point, to a degree, that he literally shed his blood. And it talked about great drops of blood that Jesus shed falling to the ground. And then we received communion, and we really focused in and remembered all that Jesus did, struggling on our behalf, but remaining sinless 
and then giving himself as a sacrifice. And so that's, what we've, that's where it's taken us to this point. Now this is the last week in this spring endurance training. So let's now move on. Let's go to verse 5 and we'll read kind of the remainder of this portion of this text where we're going to be focusing today. Hebrews 12, 5. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord. We're going to be talking today about discipline. Do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. There's that endurance again. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline in which we all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the, fathers, uh, the father of spirits and live? For they, our earthly fathers, disciplined us for a short time as seemed best to them. But he, our heavenly father, disciplines us for our good that we may share in his holiness. For the moment all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Today we're going to be speaking about discipline. Let's open in prayer. Let's ask the Lord to really work in our hearts, soften our hearts to listen and be, re be prepared to receive what he has for us. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, again, we come to you with thankful and grateful hearts. Lord, we, we thank you that we are your children. In you, Jesus, through faith in you, by your great grace, through trusting in your sacrifice, Jesus, we are welcomed, adopted into your family. And we thank you for that. And God, at the same time, we understand that as sons and daughters of you, we can expect some discipline. And Father, I pray that today we would understand the heart, your heart behind discipline. God, that, that we would all be, be open to hear what you would have to speak and, and that we would be prepared, God, to, to see discipline in a new light, in, in your light, Father. And so I just pray for this and, and that's going to require your Holy Spirit. So I ask you, Holy Spirit, to be with us now. We thank you, we love you, we worship you in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. So we're going to talk about discipline. Running this race, this endurance race with discipline. Now I think a lot of us, when we hear that word, discipline, that brings up a whole bunch of different thoughts, doesn't it? Some of those thoughts may be very, very painful. Truthfully, there may be pain and hurt associated with the discipline that you've received in your life. Or, or maybe discipline brings up a very positive thought as you think about what does a disciplined life look like? What does that feel like? You know, the, I think we all have to understand that discipline, that word discipline is extremely key in running a race of endurance. If we are going to run this race, discipline is a big part of it. Now, it's not a popular word. I understand that. It may not be a good feeling word initially. I get that. But I think this concept, this idea, this truth of discipline in God as a loving father who disciplines us is very, very important. So let's actually begin by defining this word discipline, okay? In the Greek, in this word that we're going to read about, um, here, here's, here's the word. This is what it means. It's, it's the Greek word paiadia, and here's what it means. It means instruction, education, training, and disciplinary correction. Now, now some of those look kind of good, and some of those don't sound that happy, <laughs> But look at this, instruction, education, training, and disciplinary correction. If we could put this into a phrase, here's the phrase, to nurture and train up a child. To nurture and train up a child. That is the heart of discipline, the nurturing and the training. We are God's children. He is our heavenly Father. And so he is nurturing us and his desire is to train us up by instructing us, educating us, and then at times, even in a disciplinary way, um, correcting us. So, so discipline is clearly a combination of correction, punitive correction, 
and instruction. Now, this is very important, and we're this, you're going to see this running through the whole day today. God disciplines us so that we may live a disciplined life. Okay, that is the heart. God will discipline us so that we may live a more disciplined life. And that is for our benefit, and that is ultimately for his glory and for fruitfulness. Okay, so God disciplines us so that we may be and live more disciplined. Okay, so let's walk through this passage. We're going to have our final training tips today. Okay, we've had six training tips so far throughout this series. We're going to have a few more today. Let's walk through this. Let's, let's read verse 5 again. Okay, we're going to walk through this text kind of verse by verse. Let's read verse 5. Hebrews 12, 5. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. Now, if you look at this verse, there are two things that we are not to do. Uh, do you see the two things? Number one, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord. And then it says, nor be weary when reproved by him. So when we think about those two things, don't regard it too lightly. God's discipline, nor don't be weary or tired. This leads us to our kind of our seventh endurance training tip. Here's endurance training tip number seven. Avoid the two natural pitfalls of discipline. There's two natural pitfalls when we are being disciplined by the Lord that we must avoid. Now, they're related to those two things, and they're related to not regarding it too lightly, not getting overly weary or tired when you are disciplined. There's a balance here. Here's, Here's how I phrase these two potential pitfalls. Potential pitfall number one is this. Don't downplay discipline. Don't downplay God's discipline in your life. What is this? This is when we don't take God's instruction and discipline seriously enough. When we take it too lightly, when God is disciplining us, when God is correcting us, and this is especially to when God is simply instructing us, and you know like I do, you, you are aware when God is instructing you, when he is teaching you something, when he is motivating you for something, you know what that feels like, don't you? You know when the Holy Spirit is stirring something up inside of you. And what he's saying is when that happens, that is a serious thing. Don't regard that too lightly. Don't regard that lightly. Take it seriously. Now, as a parent, maybe you can relate to this. So you got, if if you are a parent, if you're not, think of when you were a kid. Because most of you were kids at one point in your life. But remember these times when, you know, and I'm in the middle of this, so this is like fresh, front and center for me. You go through this time where your kid is going through some certain time, and you love them, and you care about them, and and so you go on, and for lack of a better word, you give them this really important, true spiel. And and it's good, and and, and it's what they need to hear, and and it's really long, and and it's very, you try to not make it too long. But it's very important, and and your kid is looking at you like, you know, it's going in one ear, and it's going right straight out the other, and they're like, yeah, okay, Dad. That is so awesome, and I will never remember that again. (laughs) Ever. Can I go play video games? (laughs) What are they doing? This is important stuff that I am helping teach and train and instruct them with, but they don't see the value of it. They're regarding it too lightly. What, what, what this verse is telling us is that don't regard when God does that with you, and he will. He will have times when he will speak directly into your life. And when he does, don't downplay that discipline, that correction, that adjustment. Don't downplay it because it's important. Now, here's the other potential pitfall in that. The second pitfall is this. Don't let discipline deflate you. Now, this is the other side, the balance. This is when, when you are corrected and when you are instructed and you can tell this doesn't feel good and you're being disciplined for something that you've done or something that you continue to do or think or act in a certain way. Don't let that discipline deflate you. Please listen to this. God does not want you to feel like a spiritual loser. That is not his goal in discipline. 
But many times we can take it as that. We can think, oh, God is disciplining me. He's correcting me. I'll never amount to anything spiritually. I am a spiritual loser. And we get deflated in that. That is not God's heart. And many times there's another influence, and we're going to talk about that later, trying to take the wind out of our sails. But he's saying, don't be weary. Don't let the discipline of the Lord, which is an important part of of an endurance walk, don't let that deflate you. So here's the balance. You have to avoid these two natural pitfalls. One, don't downplay it. When God is instructing you, it's important. It's serious. You need to think about it and try to apply it. Secondly, don't let it deflate you. Okay, that's the balancing act that we have to walk in discipline. All right, let's keep on moving. Hebrews 12, now let's go to verses 6 and 7 for our next endurance training tip. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves. This is such good news. And chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? Do you see all the, did you notice all the word sons in there? And, and did you see the word son who, who he loves and who he receives? I mean, do you see the heart behind God's discipline? God's discipline is based in the fact that you've been adopted. So here's spiritual training tip number eight. Spiritual training tip number eight. Remember that discipline is reserved for loved children. Discipline is reserved for loved children. God will discipline you because he loves you. He will cause things in your life. He will allow things. He he will discipline you in his way because you are a son or a daughter of his. You have been received into his family, and we have to remember that when we go through the discipline of the Lord, we are it, it's reserved for us as his very loved and received and welcomed and valuable children. Now When we are being disciplined, does it feel like we are loved? (laughs) No. Ask any kid, you know, the parent who says, this hurts me a lot more than it hurts you. (laughs) I always thought to my parents, well, then let me spank you instead. (laughs) (laughs) Then that'll really be discipline for me. (laughs) It never feels good. So we don't feel loved when we are being disciplined. But we must remember that that discipline is reserved for his loved children. In this passage that we just read, he uses the word sons and daughters would be implied and tied in there. He uses that word six times. In this short passage on discipline, he reaffirms the fact that, no, you are my child. And I discipline you because you are my child. We can never, ever forget that. Endurance training is building, and we have to remember this, it's building a disciplined life in us. That, that, that's what discipline is doing. It's building our disciplined life. So we have to remember that. All right, let's keep going. Verses 8 and 9. Hebrews 12, 8 and 9. If you are left without discipline, in which we have all participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? A couple of real key things, I think, in this verse related to discipline. Number one from that first phrase, we need discipline. Amen? You can say that kind of quietly. It's okay. We need it. We need discipline. Only a child that, that, that is mature and grown understands their need for discipline. They don't see it in the midst of it. But we need discipline. The other thing that very clearly, look at the last line, shall we not much more be subject? Discipline also has to do with subjection, surrender, and submission. So, so discipline is, is, is all wrapped up and tied in this idea of surrender. You know, you know, a child who is fighting back against discipline, they're only making it worse on themselves. And, and when we fight back and we kick back and we, and, we, and we try to fight against when God is clearly disciplining and correcting us, we're only making life worse. 
When we can learn how to, to surrender to that discipline and learn how to submit to the Lord, it, 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 it gets so much better and, and, and discipline gets shorter. So we can't fight it. We can't fight the need that we have for discipline. Last week, I told you a story of my Olympic moment <laughs> running a 5K coming in 45th place. But it was my Olympic moment. I said that was the only race that I've ever ran. But it is not the only race I've ever trained for. After that 5K and that super moment in the sun, I decided, and this is just a few years ago. I was pastor here at base. I didn't tell this story. But I decided I'm going to train for a half marathon. 5K, no problem. Time to train. So I decided I was going to train for and run a half marathon. And so I went online and, and how to run a half marathon. And I saw these training schedules and these training regimens and how to run a half marathon successfully. I said, I'm not a runner, I'm a jogger. So I wanted some information on how to do that. And so I looked at it and it said, okay, you need to plan out th this, this like, I don't know, 40 days or something like that where you start off and you run two miles and then you run three miles and then you walk a half a mile and then you run five miles and then you run two miles. And, and it was like, this whole big long thing and I thought that is the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life that uh, like I have to then be thinking every single day about this training that I did I, I had I had no desire for that and so I came up with my own plan <laughs> and my own plan was this I'm going to once a week just once a week I'm going to take a little bit longer and longer runs so I'm going to start off running what I feel is a little bit of a push, and then every week, I was in decent shape at that, at that point, and so I just said, I'm going to keep running more, longer and longer and longer, once a week. Sounded pretty good. I, I don't have to like spend six or seven days thinking about this. One day a week, my day off, long run, in the morning, done. By the time I get to the half marathon, I will have trained for this just right. So I, I started doing it, and literally in the beginning, it was going fine. Started off at about a half an hour. I increased about five minutes, ten minutes, five to ten minutes per week. And, and literally, what, one week I ran about an hour and ten minutes. And, and when I got done with that hour and ten minutes, I mean, I cardiovascular, I felt fine. But my knee, something in my knee felt, and it didn't, not while I was running, but when I got done, my knee kind of stiffened up. And I thought, well, that's weird. Maybe, maybe... I don't know. So the next day I decided, well, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to try to run this off. I'm, I'm just going to try to take another run and see if I can loosen this thing up. Now, no one told me to do that, but that was my, my thinking. And so I went for a run the next day, and I got back from that run, and my knee was about this big. Now, now listen to this. Please hear this. I have really not run since. I did some kind of major damage to this area that has affected me ever since. Some runner's stupid knee ailment. What I didn't realize is that schedule, that structure, was designed to not only build up my endurance here, but to build up my tendons and my ligaments and, and all the stuff that is also very involved. I didn't realize that. I had very good intentions. I had a plan. What didn't I want to do? I didn't want to go through the difficult, disciplined training process. This leads us to spiritual spring endurance training tip number nine. Listen to this. Good intentions without discipline leads to hurt. <laughs> Now, this can happen spiritually, my friends. This can really happen spiritually, where we have good intentions to serve the Lord, good intentions to run this race, but we don't want to put in the day in and the day out difficult, disciplined things of life, the spiritual things that, that cause us to, to have more endurance in this race. And when we don't do that, when we, when we try to, to move around those, those disciplines, it can lead to our hurt and it can lead to others' hurt. Okay, here's the phrase that I want us to remember. Don't shortcut. Don't try to shortcut God's work of disciplining in your life. 
Don't try to work around it. Don't try to shortcut it. I've seen a lot of folks with really good intentions that, want, that, that in their hearts they say, you know what, I want to do this for the Lord. I got this big vision. I got this big plan. I got, I got, I got all this stuff that I want to do for the Lord. And it may be very sincere and it may be very good, but maybe it's not God's time. Maybe, maybe there's still some, but, but they try to push it. They try to, they try to shortcut it and they try to just push on through. And truthfully, I've seen that lead to their hurt and I've seen it at times lead to others hurt. Now that's not saying you shouldn't have a vision and a plan and a mission to do God's work. But it's saying if God is in the process of disciplining you like he is me, don't try to shortcut that. Don't try to get around that. You know, the spiritual disciplines of in God's word, reading God's word, of prayer, uh, uh, of focusing, of worship on him, of gathering together, of loving, uh, those disciplines, those basic disciplines of the Christian life, we can't shortcut those things. We have to understand that those are very key in developing and making us, you know, that heart of abiding in the vine. That heart of, of connecting to Jesus Christ regularly for our strength, we can't shortcut that. Because when we do, it can lead to ours and other people's hurt. All right, let's finish this passage off. We have one more endurance training tip, and then we're done. Hebrews 12, verses 10 and 11. Again, for they, that's our earthly fathers, disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best for them. But he, that's God, disciplines us for our good that we may share in his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. You know, the interesting thing is I was studying this passage on discipline, and as I was studying many passages on discipline, God never tells us what discipline specifically, precisely, is going to look like in our lives. He never really tells us, when I'm going to discipline you, this is what it is going to look like. He doesn't ever tell us that. And I thought, you know, God, why? I want to tell my folks, I want to tell them what it's going to look like. And I couldn't find that. And I thought, maybe one of the reasons is because God works with us, deals with us individually. And so he disciplines us according to where we are at in our stage of life, according to who we are. He knows us intimately, and so he disciplines us specifically. And so very rarely, in fact, I couldn't find it where, where it says discipline will look like this for you. But he does tell us, and you can read, he gives us a couple very precise words on what discipline will feel like. Very clearly, he tells us what it will feel like. Look at verse 11. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. So we can know that what will discipline feel like? Well, it will feel painful and it will feel unpleasant. What has discipline looked like in my life recently? At times, discipline has been a very unsettled feeling inside of me. I have lost my peace over a situation, over a relationship, over something that has been going on around me. I have had a very, very unsettled feeling inside of me. And when I have lost peace in a situation, the Lord is trying to correct my walk. He's trying to correct my path, and I think that's one way that the Holy Spirit has worked in me, disciplining me. He has also at times disciplined me in a specific situation that is going on around me, meaning that sometimes a relationship begins to wobble or fall apart, or sometimes my financial situation seems to be going in, in a certain direction, or sometimes there is something in my life that just is not right practically, and many times what he is doing is he is disciplining me in that situation. So many times if my finances are falling apart and everything financially seems to be going in the wrong direction, it is because he is trying to teach me how to have a disciplined financial life. Or sometimes if a certain relationship is going terribly, he is trying to teach me humility in that relationship. He's trying to teach me how to be disciplined 
in that relationship. And so God works in my life inside and outside. So he works in disciplining and correcting me by, number one, many times unsettling things inside. Now, does that mean every time I am unsettled, it is a discipline issue? No, it does not mean that. But sometimes it is. Does that mean every time something has fallen apart in my life outside, it's a discipline issue? No, it doesn't mean that. But sometimes it is. So how then can I know when I am being disciplined versus when I am just living in a broken world? Well, the key to that is John 16. We're not going to read these verses. You can read them if you'd like. The key to that answer is the Holy Spirit of God that dwells inside of me. John 16 tells me that the Holy Spirit will convict me of what is called righteousness. That means right living. So when, when I am being disciplined, God's Holy Spirit inside of me will tell me, yes, you have done this, you have thought this, you have felt this, you have reacted this way. Instead of that, I'd like you to do this. And so when I am being disciplined by God, his Holy Spirit will not just leave me in this place of unsettled, I don't know what to do. He will give me clear instruction on what I am to do. And so God's Holy Spirit helps me to know when I'm simply living in a broken world that's full of broken people of whom I am one and, and life just doesn't always go well versus when I am being disciplined and corrected by God for something specifically that I am doing, I am thinking, or, or am I am responding to in some way that's not right. See, he's building a disciplined life inside of me. We also have to be very careful, and this is what I referenced earlier, that we can begin to learn the difference between conviction of the Holy Spirit and condemnation of the enemy. Now, those are two very different things, and they will both be at work in discipline. Let me explain. When we do something we should not do, the Holy Spirit convicts us, convinces us of what we should do instead. The enemy, what he wants to do is he wants to condemn us for what we did and rub our spiritual noses in it. Do you see the difference? One sucks the life out of you. That's condemnation. One wants to actually breathe new life into you. That's conviction. God's goal is not that he, we would just think and remember and let it deflate us and feel like we're spiritually worthless. That's not his goal because we can't be effective for his kingdom if we are deflated. We are loved children, my friends. We are loved. And so he corrects us so that we can live a more disciplined life for our benefit and for his kingdom and his glory and the fruitfulness that our lives can have. So when we are being convicted, we will know what we should have done. I did this, A, I should have done this, B. What do I do? God, I'm sorry. I messed this up. Sincerely, I can see I did this, I felt this, I had this thought, I had this bitterness, I felt, I did, I thought, I said, that was wrong. God, I can see what I should have done. I'm sorry for doing that. Will you help me next time? Give me some strength next time to do B instead. Condemnation is the enemy saying, you know what you did. You know who you are. You know you messed up, and that's not the first time. You don't even, you may not even be a child. You're such a spiritual loser. You know the stuff you've done. You know the stuff you continue to do. The enemy is trying to condemn you and take the very life out of you. He's trying to rub yours and my nose in what we have done. And that is condemnation. And God's word tells me there is therefore now how much condemnation? None. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen? So we don't let condemnation happen in terms of the discipline that the Lord wants to do in our life. But you see, God is working in the same situation as, as our enemy is working. And so we must learn spiritual spring endurance training. We must learn how to reject the condemnation, live with, learn from the conviction, and move on as beloved children of the Father. Now, there's also some wonderful words in these verses. 
that I want to focus on. Look at the positive words. Look at the end of verse 10. That we may share in his holiness. Now look at this. It yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. What good and important words. These are all wrapped up in discipline. Listen to this. The result of discipline is future holiness. That's being more like Jesus. The result of discipline is future peace. That's being settled on the inside of me. And the result of discipline is future righteousness, which is me making more and more and more right and godly decisions in the future. See, so discipline has many wonderful, positive results in our life. Holiness, peace, and righteousness. So here's our final spring endurance training tip. Number 10, the final one. Accept the pain of discipline as a necessary part of his perfect plan. Accept the pain. He told us it's going to be painful. It's not going to be pleasant. Accept the pain of discipline as a necessary part of his perfect plan. Discipline is clearly painful. It's unpleasant, but it makes us more like Jesus. It makes us more like Christ. Physically, none of us are born disciplined in any way. <laughs> we see that with little children. They're not born disciplined. Spiritually, we are not reborn disciplined. We're not. We are reborn in an undisciplined state. And so then God is disciplining us so that we will grow up into maturity, so that we will, that we will mature in him, so that we will be more and more like Jesus, so that our lives can be more of a reflection of who he is, bringing him more glory and have our, our lives be more fruitful. God spends time with us so that he can teach us and train us and instruct us. This is all part of his perfect plan to make us more like himself. Here's the conclusion of the matter, of the series. Discipline often feels punitive, it feels painful, and it feels icky. It lasts longer than I feel is necessary. I've had many people ask me that question. How long does the pain of discipline last? In my experience, it lasts longer than I feel is necessary. And it lasts longer than after I've already learned the lesson. Can you relate to that? You go through something. You learn the lesson. You think, God, I'm ready to move on now. Aren't we ready to move on now? <laughs> and it lasts. It lasts a little longer than I feel is necessary. It has a goal of turning our sometimes broken behavior into a disciplined life. You see, the goal of discipline is turning us as broken individuals into disciplined disciples of Jesus. That's the goal of this. Discipline's goal is a disciplined life. And discipline is ultimately motivated by the love of of our perfect heavenly Father. See, the motivation of discipline is that we have a Father who loves us, loves us enough to discipline us. Let's pray. Our heavenly Father, we thank you. God, it's hard to say thanks for discipline, but thanks for discipline. God, I thank you for loving us enough to correct us, to instruct us, to teach us. Father, I pray that we don't regard or think about or, or look at your discipline too lightly, God. It's serious. It's important. Help us to see it as important. And in the areas where you are currently disciplining us, help us to identify those areas and act accordingly. God, at the same time, I pray that the discipline that, that, that you allow in our life and that you put forth in our life, that it doesn't deflate us. 
God, because we don't want to feel like spiritual losers. You don't see us that way. We are loved children. So, Father, I pray that you'd help us to have the right heart and attitude and endure through discipline, God, knowing that it is building and, 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 and making us into more disciplined disciples for you, Jesus. So we love you, we thank you, we worship you in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to sing a song, and it's, it's, it's kind of an older song, but it fits so beautifully. It talks about righteousness is what I long for. Faithfulness is what I need. Holiness is what God wants to build in me. And this is such the heart of discipline that, that these things that God wants to build in us, he builds in us through discipline. So let's stand and let's sing this as a worship song that his heart is to make us more like himself. Unfortunately, we don't get spiritually reborn perfectly disciplined. So there's a little bit of work that he needs to do in us. Let's accept that pain. Let's accept that work. Let's accept that correction as a part of his perfect plan to make us like him, to prepare us to worship him for eternity. Amen?